to introduce uh, Francisco Bona and to chair the proceedings. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shikant, uh, for inviting me to chair the session and this very generous introduction. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, happy to uh, welcome on behalf of the uh, organizers and the participants, Professor Francesco Vona. Professor Vona, I don't see you on my screen. Uh, is your video on? Yeah, you have to scroll to the right. I I've got to scroll to yes. that. Okay, that's fine. That doesn't really matter. Well, let me do that. Let me. Yes. Hi. Nice to see you. Welcome. Hi, nice welcome. to see you. Very nice to welcome, see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I will Hello. be very brief, everybody, partly also because I'm uh, suffering from a, uh, a cough and I don't want a coughing fit to come on if I speak too much and also not to keep you away from the speaker. So, um, you know, with the briefest of introductions, I will uh, start the session. Uh, uh, let me also mention that uh, I request everybody to send in their um, questions via the, I don't see a Q&A here, we are the chat box, uh, so that I don't have to read them out. But I request you to do that about half an hour into the session so that Professor Vona is not unnecessarily distracted. I'm sure he will take on whatever questions you sent him in due course. Now, okay, uh, now um, Professor Vona is uh, a very young uh, senior economist at, uh, the, at the Sciences Po at the French Economic Observatory, uh, which is a very nice uh, expression. I haven't heard of that. So I think we could do also with such expressions in India. So anyway, he's going to speak on skills for a green economy, uh, for the green economy, excuse me, what, where, and how much. Uh, Professor Mona, I've uh, had the privilege of seeing your slides in advance. Uh, I just want to suggest to you that the uh, empirical work which you presented in tables of regressions, you might want to just take a second or two when you present them to kind of set them in context so that everybody's able to benefit from these very good results that you have uh, uh, achieved from your research. Thank you very much. The floor is yours now. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a privilege to be invited uh, here and, uh, and uh, would have been much better to be in person. I would have really enjoyed to, to, come, uh, to come to India. Also, you know, my uh, uh, my one of my best friend is Indian, and we were, you know, we did all the high school together. So I always uh, really appreciate the the Indian uh, culture, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, and so is is a pity that I cannot come <laughs> physically <laughs> to to you. So anyway, uh, let's start the talk. So actually, uh, this uh, uh, let me share my screen. Voila. Okay. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Yes, great. So I put full screen. Okay, so great. Uh, well, uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about my the research I have conducted for the last you know, six, seven years with a great team of uh, co-authors uh, on green skills and jobs. This great team of co-authors include mainly David Pop from Syracuse University and Giovanni Marin from University of Urbino, but then several others uh, co-authors are also, you know, has been involved in this, uh, in this uh, research. So I will present to you an overview of, uh, of uh, a new approach to uh, measure uh, the, green, the, the green labor, green skills, and more in general, the uh, labor market impacts of uh, environmental policy. Okay, so that's uh, uh, my, my goal today. So why I want to give you some context, uh, why this is important? Well, as you know, several countries are planning to use uh, the, uh, the post-pandemic, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the green fiscal, green spending plans to, uh, to tackle environmental problems in the post-pandemic world, if uh, we will ever uh, uh, end up this uh, this pandemic. Uh, well, actually, uh, for instance, in Europe, we have a, a plan that has not been yet fully approved, but is uh, in, a, you know, in an advanced stage that allocated about one, one fourth of the 
of a huge spending, public spending package to climate friendly expenditures. These expenditures are, are uh, cover an area of intervention that are ranging from uh, sustainable mobility, infrastructure, energy grid, uh, uh, smart grids, storage technology, uh, waste recycling and the circular economy, eco building, and so on and so forth. Well, <clears throat> much of the, of the focus of these plans <clears throat> has been on the <clears throat> material infrastructure. So, on building the new capital equipment for, uh, uh, for the, the green transition for basically a low carbon economy. Okay? Much less attention has been paid to develop the immaterial infrastructure. So basically the know-how for uh, uh, that, uh, that will complement this uh, material infrastructure. If you have in mind a standard uh, growth model, we have this kind of capital skill complementarity. So if you introduce a new type of capital, you will need new type of skills to operate and to develop these new machines. Okay? And, and so actually, this, the attention has been much less on the development of competencies. And uh, uh, however, there are type of questions that are extremely relevant, for both the effectiveness of the green stimulus packages and for the equity results of this stimulus. So for instance, which type of training investments are required for the green economy? Who are the workers that require more training? So how to offset the potentially negative distributional effects for certain type of worker? Of course, everybody have in mind coal miners, but there are many others. Uh, well, just to uh, spend two words on how this reskilling uh, uh, is important in the agenda of countries. Whereas there, is, there has been a huge interest for this type of work on green skills, on green jobs for several, from several institutions. Actually, uh, if you have a look at the, the, the OECD developed a database on the proposed measure of the green recovery packages for 45 countries, uh, including India. And uh, if you scroll this, this measure in the OECD database, you will end up seeing that only 2.1% of these measures uh, are uh, for retraining. Okay, so very, very small part of uh, the plan spending package around the world is uh, will tackle this issue of reskilling and retaining. Okay, uh, just to compare, to give you context, uh, 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 around 6% of, uh, of these measures are for uh, green and renewable. Okay, uh, so actually, I will show you in this talk, and I want to just, just give a very important preview that the allocation of this fund as it is now around the world uh, is going to lead to an inefficient result because uh, green skill investments are key in increasing the positive impact that uh, a green stimulus package can have on, uh, on the economy, on economic growth. Okay. Uh, well, let's go back to a bit to pre the preliminary because that's just, you know, the broad motivation, but uh, I mean, why skills are important, why skills is a central concept in understanding uh, the uh, low carbon transition. Well, first of all, skills are what we can see as, I mean, we can call tacit knowledge in the sense that we, we know more th than what we can tell, the famous Polani, uh, Polani sentence. And uh, these are extremely important, is opposed to codified knowledge like patent, uh, is extremely important for two reasons. One, the skills are the key ingredients to develop uh, the codified knowledge. So if you don't have skills, you cannot do innovation. Okay, that's clear, I mean. Uh, and uh, so that's the first point. And so also to develop a comparative advantage in green production. Uh, so for instance, India, uh, I, remember, I remember for the uh, nice paper on energy policy of, uh, of a partner with Matthew Kahn, uh, can develop a green comparative advantage in wind turbine. Okay. Uh, so that's, it's, it's essential to have the skills that allow to develop these, uh, these new technologies. And, but it's also important, this concept for the distributional effect of uh, uh, environmental policies in the labor market, uh, because actually having the right skills allow to, of course, to be more productive in the workplace and so to earn, uh, uh, to, to earn higher salary or at least to have more bargaining power to earn higher salary. And it's also extremely important for the distributional effect of environmental policies, as long as people sort into location uh, with, with similar with people similar to each other. So there will be location where there will be more people with the right, let's say green skills, I will define that, don't worry, uh, and location with, uh, instead of skills, more related to fossil fuel technology. Okay, and so this will create a special distributional effect that are extremely important. <clears throat> so in this talk, 
I, I will first uh, make the case for uh, the so-called task-based approach to study green labor markets. Uh, and uh, uh, this approach has been uh, popularized by David Author and co-authors at the MIT to study the impact of new technologies on the labor market. And I will show you how we can apply and adapt, of course, to uh, green labor market. And then I will present you for application how using this approach to measure green employment improves dramatically the precision of our understanding and also our understanding conceptually of what is green employment, how to use it to identify green skills, how uh, these green skills mediate the, the effectiveness of uh, green fiscal plans, and if I have time, uh, a bit about uh, winner and loser, so distributional effects of this policy. And then I will give you some policy recommendation and avenues for future research. <laughs> well, uh, well, the task-based approach to labor market has a, a key element, which is a, a, a functional distinction between what is a task and what is a skill. That's uh, the, the essential thing that you have to understand. On the one hand, we have tasks. So tasks are, are unit of work that uh, produce output. Okay? So this is the demand side of the economy. Okay? Uh, then there are skills that are the capability for performing various tasks. Okay? So, uh, and this is the supply side of the economy. I will make uh, examples very, uh, very soon, but for the moment, I want to remain a bit uh, at the a kind of abstract level. So actually you have, to, you have to imagine a production function where you don't have capital and labor that directly enter in producing output, but the production function is uh, composed by tasks. So you have several tasks. So to produce uh, a computer, you need uh, an assembly task, you need uh, a design task and so on and so forth. Okay, so these tasks are combined in a production function that produce output, okay? Then, Productive factor re-enter in the picture because they compete in producing a certain task. Okay, so each production fact, each task can be produced by several production factors. So, for instance, uh, the task of uh, design can be produced by computers, by robots, can be uh, can be done by uh, eff energy efficient machineries, can be done by energy directly, can be done by workers, by labor, okay, with with different skills. Okay, and this will be the focus of uh, today's talk. So actually, you can imagine that I mean each task, uh, each productive factor compete in performing a task. Okay? So the, then, when you want to understand how, which will be the demand of this productive factor, well, you you have to uh, determine a certain rule, and this of course is part of a theoretical model that assign productive factor to task. Okay, so we, according to which rule a productive factor can be assigned to task? I mean, we can think of in a planned economy. Uh, is a, a social planner that assigns tasks to productive factor. In a market economy, obviously, the, the real mechanism, the, the main mechanism is that the relatively cheaper factor is used to produce a task. Relatively cheaper, why? Because of course you have to, this trade-off between the cost of the factor and the, how the factor is productive. Okay? So this, this classical trade-off in a, a kind of Ricardian comparative advantage theory. Okay? Uh, so factor cost uh, obviously depends on policy. Okay, so uh, if you can imagine a carbon tax, the carbon tax will increase the, 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 the cost of uh, energy produced through coal. Uh, so the, the task that was previously allocated to coal, okay, now will probably be allocated to another productive factor. Workers, physical capital, and an energy efficient machinery or whatever. So actually, uh, when you're going to, to shift a uh, productive factor to produce a task, of course, the demand of coal will, will decrease, the aggregated demand will decrease, and the aggregated de de demand of the productive factor that is used instead of coal will increase. Okay? That's the idea. So actually, why is it so important, this approach? Because this approach allows a very granular understanding of the so-called race between technology and education. So, uh, we know that new technology requires new skills, and we know that to, to uh, produce these skills, we need to change the educational system to create a new, uh, new educational program. And this, this approach allows to understand this, because allows to see what happened in each task and then to aggregate them uh, through a task production function. Okay? So just to make you an example, okay, the set of tasks changed because of technological change. Uh, well, an example, there was no coding in all society. So there was not a task coding in all society. Well, the set of skills adapt to new technology, so there were no degrees in computer science for new, new society. And as you see, this task-based approach allows to understand at the task level, which can be the adaptation of the educational system. Okay. We discussed this issue in a quite of a general uh, paper with uh, David Consul in ICC, 
uh, and we try to understand which are the institutional mechanisms that enable the formalization and the diffusion of uh, uh, new know-how and new skills. Okay? And there are also factors affecting this. Of course, uh, there is the type of labor market, and the more flexible, the less flexible, uh, the broad feature of the educational and training system. And all these factors affect the skill formation in ways that are not obvious. So for instance, rigid labor market favor the, uh, the investments in specific skills because the worker have more incentive to invest in skills if they know that it's more difficult to find them. Okay, so that's a standard theoretical result. Uh, and so we have several aspects of this, okay? Uh, and uh, obviously, the types of education and training interventions depend on the type of the technology. That's the key point of today's lecture, okay? And I will go in one second to the green part. So, but before going to the green part, just to let you understand this concept, there is a very nice uh, paper that uh, I think has been really underappreciated of Kruger and Kumar on the Journal of Monetary Economy. And they, uh, they try to understand that there was a big research question in the 90s. And the question was why the US uh, they don't, uh, absorb much better ICT technology than Europe. And so why the US have a labor market that is more dynamic than Europe uh, in the 90s. And there were lots of research that tried to prove that uh, flexibility in the labor market was the key. They never were able to prove this uh, empirically. And so there, is, there are these two guys that say, well, look, it's not uh, really the type of labor market that matters here, but it's the type of educational system. So the German educational system, and they take the example of Germany versus, U versus US, is very good at creating specific skills that, that are skills that complement specific technology because they, this, this, the German system is a system where there is a lot of degree of coordination among actors. So there are incumbents, firms, uh, unions, uh, and uh, uh, vocational training institutions that cooperate to understand the skill gaps that uh, emerge in, in, in specific applications. Okay? Uh, and this is very good for when, when technology is specific. But when technology is general, like general purpose, like the it was the ICT technologies. This educational system is not adapting as well as the US system that instead is be much better in producing general skill through university education. Okay? And this point uh, I will show you is exactly reversed for the green economy. So in green economy, vocational training and the apprenticeship system are much more important than uh, general education. But let me prove this uh, in, in the talk. So now this is the general picture. What, what is relevant for the green economy? The task allow for a general definition of what has, is a green occupation. So we can use this approach to understand how prevalent are tasks related to green technologies in a given occupation. We can observe co-occurrences between tasks and skills to derive reveal comparative advantage schedule. So we can understand which skills are more important to perform green tasks, basically. Okay? And then we can see how the variability of the appropriate skills is important to enhance the economic effect of uh, uh, green industrial policies. And then we can measure the proximity of the skill content of the skill requirement between green and non-green occupation to understand how easy it is to reallocate a worker displaced by, the, uh, by a carbon tax into green activity. So it's a lot of stuff that can be done in this, in this approach. Okay. So let me start with the simplest one, how we can improve the measure of green employment. Okay. Well, um, so is that, as you know, I mean, the, the definition of green job is very elusive, it's very ambiguous, it's, uh, uh, there is a lot of great literature that is always unclear on, on how to define green jobs. Okay, So the, you know there are lots of problems related to the fact that, for instance, how we treat biofuel, is a green or not green job? I don't want to enter, of course, in this, but what I want to tell you is that there are lots of misleading binary definition of, uh, uh, of, uh, of green job if we take the standard occupational classification. So for, uh, for instance, if you want to define an occupation like green or not, according to the standard occupational classification, how we define construction workers? Are green or not green? Obviously, they are green sometimes, they are not green other times, okay? They are green when they, they, they are building a, a, a smart house, but they are not green when they are building a pipeline, okay? So actually, if we take this binary definition, we will make a lot of mistakes, okay? We will be very, we will be a lots of measurement error in what we define as green, okay? So 
Lucky enough, there is this database that is called the, uh, the Occupational Information Network. It's a publicly available database, very rich. Uh, that is a, a database that is available from 2000, but there are also uh, previous versions of this database that uh, date back to after the Great Recession of 29. Uh, and uh, uh, this database has been built, it was called before the Dictionary of Occupation and Title, has been built to understand exactly which are the uh, skill, uh, the skill required for new jobs after a great recession, okay? So after the 29th recession, okay? Uh, but the, 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 the most, uh, I mean, sophisticated version is available only from 2000, okay? Everything is online. So, I mean, the, there is, uh, uh, everything is available uh, online and is public access, okay? So this database contains very detailed description of the task and skill contents for more than 900 occupations, lots of occupations. And uh, uh, we have the task that are specific of each occupation. We can imagine them, and I'll show you in one slide, uh, them as a, 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 a rich text description. So for each task, we have a, we have a line of, of text. Okay? And then we have, and these are specific to each occupation. So each occupation have like 14 line of text or so 14 tasks that define what they do in the job. Okay? Then they have the skills. Then skills are uh, general in the sense that they are defined for all the occupations. So they are around 400 skills. And uh, for all the occupation, we have a score. So for instance, manual worker have a score of one in problem solving, whereas engineers have a score of five in problem solving. Okay? I will show the example in one slide. So, and then there is a green economy program uh, where some occupations and tasks, both occupation and task are flagged like green. Okay. So we have around 100 occupations that are flagged like, like green, and we have uh, within these 100 occupations, some tasks that are flagged like green and some tasks that are flagged as non-green. Let me give you an example that is easier. So this is the structure of the net data. So we have the demand side. So this, this is the vector of occupation specific task and vector length varies by occupation. So for some occupation, there are 15 line of, of, of description of the occupation, so 15 tasks. For other, there are 10, for other 20. Uh, and then we have the supply side that is a vector of general skills that is defined for all the occupation. Let's, let, let me show you first the vector of, of, uh, of task. So this vector is partitioned in two sub vectors. One vector is the green task and one vector is the non-green task. Let me give you an example. So for instance, for the occupation supply chain manager, we have a, a green task that is life cycle analysis for the environmental impact. But for the same occupation, we also have a non-green task, which is negotiate prices and terms with suppliers and vendors, okay? And so on and so forth. So for, a, for instance, for a, a, a roofer, for the occupation roofer, we have installed solar roofing systems, is a green task, but we have inspect problem to determine the repairing procedure of roofs, that is a non-green task, okay? That's the task part, okay? Uh, and this green task, uh, I, remember, uh, I, I recall to you, of 900 occupation, only 100 occupation that are also defined by ONET as green can have tasks that are green, okay? That's the point. Then we have the supply side. It's a vector of general skills. So for all of these occupations, so for supply chain manager, roofers, wind energy engineers, uh, aerospace engineer, uh, et cetera, et cetera, nurse, we have uh, that for all the, of these occupations, we have a very long vector of 500 skills, uh, where for each occupation, we have for each skills a, a score. Okay, so for instance, we have a score of one in writing, uh, mathematics, uh, inductive reasoning, clerical design, et cetera, et cetera. And for each occupation, we have a score for each of those, of those skills. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so let's go back to the fact that on it, uh, can have, can, we can use two definitions in ONET to define what a green job is. One is the standard binary definition. So we just say, well, an occupation is green or not green. And ONET subdivide this occupation, like new green occupations, so occupations that are new and green, and occupations that are green and answer. So they will change the skill set because of the green economy. And so this is, is the binary definition of green occupation, but this binary definition that we show in, in one slide, this uh, is not satisfactory, it's very imprecise. So what we did in this research is to uh, build a continuous definition of uh, what is green, what is a green job that is based on tasks. So occupational greenness is proportional to the share of green tasks performed by the occupation. Okay, so for instance, uh, the, the, the formula is this one. So we have the greenness of the occupation K is the, is the number of green tasks in the for the occupation K over the total number of tasks in the occupation K. So in the example of supply chain manager, we had, remember, two tasks. There are more, but in this example, it's just two. One was green, the other no. So uh, supply chain manager is 50% green. 
Okay, so how we interpret this greenness? Because the interpretation like this looks not very transparent, but it is transparent using the task, the task model. Well, it's transparent because this can be interpreted as the average share of time spending in performing green activities in the average occupation, in a way, so by the average uh, supply chain manager uh, in the US, or can be interpreted as a, the average share of jobs that are doing green activities. So for instance, imagine that the, we have car repairers. Uh, car repairs can be for uh, electric and hybrid vehicles and can be for uh, uh, fuel engine vehicles, okay? So imagine that we have in the US 10% of electric and hybrid cars. So uh, this greenness for car repairs will be 10%, okay? That's the idea. Uh, so let's see, obviously, I mean, this measure is not, is, uh, not perfect, okay? So because there is lots of heterogeneity, this is the average measure is the only thing that we can observe. But we can observe it for 900 occupations, so it's a lot, okay? So let's see how uh, this greenness indicator improves on the understanding of what is a green occupation, okay? So here uh, on the row, we have a green enhanced occupation or new green and emerging occupations. So according to the net definition, all these occupations written here and written here are fully green. So for instance, for the net definition, bi binary definition, construction worker is fully green. Obviously it's not fully green, construction worker, or uh, marketing manager are fully green. If we improve this definition by using the greenness, we see that the occupation with greenness equal one, so fully green are expected. So environmental science technician is a fully green occupation, a recycling coordinator is a fully green occupation, but there are occupations that are not fully green. They are 30% green like construction worker or uh, maintenance and repairing or compliance manager, okay? Uh, so actually this give you a, a smooth, continuous distribution of greenness across occupation. So why this is better than using a binary definition? Let's, let's take these two and let's see, using these two definitions, how big will be the green employment in the US? Okay, how to do this? We simply build this measure, which is this, the binary green employment share uh, at time t in all the US. And this emp green employment share is the sum uh, over all the 900 occupation from K equal one to K big, that is 900, of uh, the mm, employment share of each occupation at time T. So this will be the, uh, if LK is engineers, will be the share of employment of engineer over total employment in the US, uh, multiplied by the fact that the occupation is green or not, okay? So it will be zero, this dummy will be zero if the occupation is not green, will be one if it's green, right? So we, we have this dummy is equal one for only 100 occupation. Okay, so when we sum up, okay, we obtain the total green employment share according to the binary definition, we obtain 11, around 11%. Then we use the task-based definition. So what we did here is to use the same formula, but instead of using a dummy equal one for the, if the occupation is green according to net, we, uh, we use the greenness measure. Remember, greenness measure capture the share of time an occupation K spend into green activities. So obviously this is always lower than one and is defined only for the occupation that are green. So for these 100 occupations, so obviously this measure will be smaller than this one. And we end up having a, a share of green employment that is between two or 3% depending on <coughs> some uh, sub-definition of task of green tasks that are considered as core. So if their core is 2% or core and not core and became 3%. Okay. So which one is right? Which one is wrong? Well, we externally validate these two measures by using product, green production data. Okay? For the US, uh, we have uh, for 2010 and 2011, the, a survey that is very detailed with uh, around 15,000 plants that is called the Green Good and Service Survey. There are two papers published on, on this survey, uh, descriptive papers. And uh, this survey uh, gives a share of green, green products and green production and green services of around 2% for 2010, 2011. Uh, we developed a similar methodology in a uh, recent working paper for the uh, European countries with Filippo Bontadini, uh, that is only for green manufacturing here, for production of green goods in manufacturing. And we end up having uh, the same, around 2.5%, 2, 2 just to give you context, in Germany, the share of green uh, uh, goods production in, in manufacturing is around 3.3%. In Denmark, which is the top country in Europe, obviously, for wind turbine, is around 7%. Okay, so 
obviously green production is proportional to green employment okay and uh, actually obviously uh, the two percent that we end up uh, having with a task-based approach is much closer to this share that we obtained with uh, using measuring what is green using green production than the 11 percent okay so actually it's very unlikely that the the, the labor intensive labor intensity of uh, of green production is four times higher than the labor intensive intensity of non-green of non-green production actually uh, using this database for europe uh, we show that actually the labor intensity is slightly higher for green production but the, the impact is very small okay the difference is very small uh well then we use this database uh, in a in a kind of uh, uh, spatial way we map this uh, greenness not at the national level like here but at the uh, uh, at the uh, metropolitan area level so because we have the employment share at the metropolitan area level in the us and so we 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 end up having some facts on green employment first green employment is more procyclical than non-green employment so it's more sensitive to the recession uh, the low skill green employment green jobs pay a wage premium that is uh, uh, also quite high high although this is an unconditional wage premium so we don't control for a uh, factor affecting the wage premium like education that the demographics uh, so leading green areas exhibit a strong presence of high-tech activities that's another important point because they have they have their structure is strong in a way and we will return on this uh, a lot in this talk and then we we, we we end up measuring a green job local multiplier that is between two and four depending on we, whether we measure it before the recession that is here around here you see in this graph around 2000 the, the, the great recession of 2009 or after the great recession and, and after of course the multiplier are, are, are big okay so this green job local multiplier uh, is uh, closer to the local green job multiplier of high-tech activities than to the one of uh, fossil fuel activities the one of fossil fuel activities is around one from previous research the one of high-tech activities is between three and five okay so the indirect job creation due to the creation of one green job imagine a wind a wind turbine uh, uh, engineer is going to create an uh, have an indirect job creation in the local economy of between two and four jobs okay which is pretty good okay so in terms of insights for industrial green industrial policy so then uh, uh, i will focus now on the second application which is how how we use this approach to identify green skills is mostly based on a uh, on the paper on the uh, jerry uh, but is also based now on a research that uh, <coughs> conducted with that with a new team uh, from lsi misato sato and aurelien sosse uh, using uh, a job vacancy data so i will show you some results also in this okay just, just i mean just to preliminary question now we, de we have now we have a kind of better definition of green job not not perfect but better okay than the one that we had before I hope that I convince you that this is better. Okay. So now the question is how green jobs differ from non-green jobs in terms of uh, standard measures of human capital. Okay. And so here, uh, here these two plots uh, answer this question. The first plot tell you that uh, in terms of here we, de we define green jobs in terms of high green jobs, the, the, the one that have greenness above 0 0.5, above, above 50 percent, medium green jobs, the one that have greenness below 50 percent, and non-green jobs. So you see that. The, in terms of schooling, uh, the, the three types of jobs are very similar. Okay, so they, they require the same type of number of years of education. But in terms of training and experience, that are two proxy of specific human capital, these on the job training. Okay, so it's training done by companies uh, and uh, or uh, by workers in in the context of a, a company reskilling program. Uh, so this you see that uh, much much the requirement for green jobs is much higher than the requirement for non green jobs. Okay. When we, we, we look at the requirement in terms of tasks, these are the task measure of, uh, used by David Author to understand the impact of ICT technologies in the labor market. So non-routine cognitive, non-routine interactive are uh, tasks that cannot be substituted by computer and by robot, whereas routine tasks can be substituted by robot and can be routine cognitive, like uh, uh, the usual tasks done by uh, bank teller, secretary, and job like this. Uh, routine manual is the jobs that are uh, replaced by robot in the, in the in manufacturing. Then there are non routine manual that are jobs that uh, instead cannot be replaced by, by computer, but they are manual, like bus driver, and the jobs that are uh, offshoreable. Okay, they, they are, then they can, they can be performed uh, elsewhere. Okay, 
So as you see, uh, compared to these four, five, uh, to these uh, uh, six measures, sorry, of uh, of task that are, are very important for understanding ICT technologies, the, the the green jobs are very similar to other jobs, except for non-routine cognitive uh, tasks that are like problem solving uh, and stuff like this. Okay. So actually, what 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 this picture tell us? Okay, we um, we identify some gap in uh, in terms of uh, of uh, human capital requirement. Uh, uh, for uh, that uh, characterize green jobs. So the green jobs require more on the job training and more experience. But on other measure, we didn't find really much. Okay, so what, what we do, what we did then, we said, okay, well, let's search more about this. Let's try to investigate more if there are really skills that really characterize green jobs. And so what we did is to uh, estimate the real comparative advantage measure. So we use the greenness index to select the set of general skills that are particularly relevant for green intensive occupation by correlating the score of the skill uh, S in occupation K with the greenness of occupation K, uh, condition for occupation fixed effect that allow to compare this very simple. To, we, we are not interested in comparing a green engineer uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 I don't know, uh, a doctor. A healthcare practitioner. We are interested in comparing a green engineer with a, a, a non-green engineer. Okay, so that's why we introduce this dummy, this occupation. Okay, so and we define and we run this regression for all the 400 skills. Okay, uh, okay, so for all this regression and the number of, of observation is 900, number of occupation, and the S is that we, we run 400 regression for all of these of, of, of these skills. So we end up having that defining a general skill as green if this beta coefficient is greater than zero and statistically significant at one percent. Okay, so. With this procedure, we obtained 16 of such green general skills, and these results are super robust. There is, I mean, uh, like uh, 60, 50 page appendix in this paper that uh, show that they're super robust. But there, anyway, 16 skills are quite a lot. Okay, so what we did then is try to say, okay, let's see if there are patterns. And to understand the patterns, we use principal component analysis. Why we use principal component analysis? Because this principal component allows us to uh, aggregate these 16 skills in, gr in groups that have. Uh, perhaps a, meaning, uh, a meaningful uh, sense, uh, and also to rank which group is more important. Okay, so we did this, and uh, let, me, let me show you the 16 skills. The 16 skills are, uh, are grouped in four groups. The first group, the most important, is engineering and technical skills. And this group is uh, uh, containing uh, uh, skills like uh, engineering and technology, design that are quite uh, high, I mean, in the sense that they require quite a lot of education, but there are also skills that require much less education, like building and construction, mechanical, drafting, and so on and so forth. This is the first green skill, okay, the most important. Then there is a second one that is operation management that includes stuff like system analysis, system evaluation, updating and using relevant knowledge, provide consultation. That's the second green skill. Then there is the third green skill that is monitoring, that has to do with law and government, so it's the, the relationship with the regulator, is extremely important for green activities and uh, uh, and also evaluating information to determine competence with standards so it's a kind of more technical monitoring skill now we have science of course physics and biology okay so actually uh, uh, obviously if we redo the graph that i mean the kind of spider net that we, i did before you see that the difference between high green medium green and non-green occupation in terms of these skills is very high because it's by construction very high it's by construction maximized by this regression but is much higher for engineering and technical so take away green skills are engineering type of skill with a strong reliance on experience heuristic integrity form of practical knowledge and they are much more specific than uh, compared to ICT skills, okay? And that's key, really a key point. And actually, uh, since I will never be able to do all the all what I want to tell you, this evidence is consistent with, with the European data, is consistent with the uh, job vacancy data, is, I mean, always technical engineering skills appear to be the most important. So then just to be, to convince you more, even more that this engineering and technical dimension of green jobs is extremely important, I correlate these four green skills with standard measure of human capital. One is the routine task intensity, which is the kind of summary of this uh, routine and non-routine task uh, show you before. It is a share of routine task over non-routine task. So the higher it is, the more the job is easy to re be replaced by computers and by, and by digital technology. Okay. So uh, low, low level of routine task intensity means that the job is more complex and more difficult to be replaced by computers. You see that 
for science, monitoring, and operation management, they are quite highly correlated with the routine task intensity index. So what does it mean? It means that, I mean, these three dimensions of the green skills are important, but if we use routine task intensity, we will lose a bit of information, but not too much. However, engineering and technical skills are not correlated at all with the routine task intensity. So in this case, if we use routine task intensity to proxy green skills, we make a big mistake. But remember, engineering and technical skills are the most important. So actually, they really characterize green jobs. <laughs> if we do the same for year of schooling, again, year of schooling are positively correlated with operation management, monitoring, and science green skills, but not at all with engineering and technical. Okay? Because as, as you remember, engineering and technical include both high skills, I mean, skills that require a lot of education, and skills that require medium level of education, mostly vocational training. So this is the main takeaway. So then we try to understand whether uh, the demand for green skills respond to environmental policies. We use the standard quasi, uh, quasi experimental research design of the Green Act. I want to be quick, uh, and we map these green skills by, to metropolitan area. We use the standard diff in diff plus matching estimator. And actually find that actually the biggest impact of an increase in environmental policy stringency in the US <laughs> is uh, on engineering skills. Then we do the same type of analysis using uh, job vacancy data for burning gas technologies, a private company that uh, uh, scraped all the uh, online job vacancy in the US uh, uh, since 2010. Um, and, uh, and they classify, the company already have an algorithm that classify each, each job out uh, in, and transform it in a vector of skills, like on it. So it does the same type of work as on it. And then we know for each job out to which broad occupation belong to. So we, what, what's the advantage of this database is that before we were able to identify patterns ag on aggregate, okay? Here we are able to identify patterns that are specific to each occupation. So we can really do the same analysis, but separately for each occupation. Um, and, uh, uh, and in this application, we don't focus on all green, uh, uh, all green type of problems or all types of environmental problems, but we focus only on low carbon job ads. And to classify a low carbon job ads, we use natural processing language technique, like a, in this case, a bag of word model. We combine with some expert elicitation. So, I mean, to be sure that this is uh, the right stuff. And so we to identify which job ad, which job ad is, is low carbon, so it's, it's related to low carbon technologies. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so to, to have, uh, uh, to have uh, this kind of flagging of uh, low carbon job ads, okay? And then we characterize low carbon job ads with respect to high carbon job ads, so job ads that instead are for, of the fossil fuel, basically jobs, and uh, with other ads, but within specific occupation, because <coughs> for instance, for engineers, instead of having a single, just for like to understand, in, in the ONET, we have a single greenness matrix for uh, chemical engineer or for electrical engineer. Okay, you know that electrical engineer we have a greenness index of uh, 0.3. In this case, uh, we can observe within the group of electrical engineers who are the green electrical engineers and we are, who are not the green, okay? That's a big difference, okay? So, uh, and this is just to, let, to show the share of low carbon job ads in the several occupations as, as expected and consistently with Donet, we have that architectural engineers are the greenest uh, occupation together with the uh, life and physical and social science, construction and extraction and installation maintenance and repair. So they are kind of these and, and business and financial operation. Okay, so these are the five uh, greenest, uh, low most low carbon occupation. There is also transportation and material mover that are, is very green, uh, but this is just because we included in our keywords for, for searching green jobs, green job apps, uh, public transport. Okay, so actually, we will not focus a lot on this. Okay, so this will uh, remain, uh, we, I will focus on these five occupations. Okay, so what we did here is then to try to compare uh, green and non green job ads within the occupation along several skill dimensions that are already defined. And again, technical skills for each of those occupations, so for engineers, business specialists. Uh, these are technicians, so like mid, middle, I mean, a middle skilled occupation that is uh, uh, that are you know required, like I think, two years of college or two years of postgraduate, post high school edu vocational education in general. And uh, for instance, installation, maintenance, and repairing occupation. So for all of them, 
technical skills are the most important skills. Actually, if you see more in detail, generally green occupation requires in general a bit more skills also along other dimensions than other occupations, so also along some IT relevant dimension, you know. But again, the gap is much bigger than technical skills. Okay? Then we, we try to understand to what extent the, the, the skills that are green, that are, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, important in green occupations, uh, are also the skills that are important in general in this occupation. Okay, so we correlate the occupation, the, the skills that are important in, for engineers with the green skills that are important for engineers. And you see that we find a, generally a positive correlation. What does it mean that? Uh, green jobs, for instance, this is for engineer, require to specialize in skills that are also the core skills of the occupation. So basically the path of uh, reskilling for engineers is not very difficult because they have just to further specialize in, into, this, uh, into the skills that where they are already kind of strong. Okay? And the same for construction workers. Okay? Uh, then we, we, we use this data to uh, understand uh, if there is a, a wage premium for low carbon uh, jobs. And uh, uh, here, we, this is the estimated wage premium with, the, the, with this dot in 2010-2012 is an average, and this is the estimated wage premium for 2017-2019. Uh, you can see that for all these six occupations that, that uh, are the focus of our analysis, because they are the most important green uh, uh, low carbon occupations, there has been a decrease in the wage premium paid for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, in, in, for green job ads. Okay, so this, this is not the real wage paid, but it's the wage offered in the job ad. Okay, so the job ad report uh, a wage offer. Okay, and, and you see that there has been a decline for all of them. Uh, and uh, the, there was a positive wage premium uh, in 2010-2012 uh, that uh, be, became virtually zero in the, in the second period. And this is important because this allowed me then to start uh, uh, speaking about the green recovery package aligned with the policy change that we experienced in the US. These are the same graph, but with the uh, year by year estimates. Uh, uh, aligned with the policy change in the US. So in 2010 was the year where the green stimulus package of Obama uh, start, you know, disburse, disburse money, start to be, you know, uh, to, to spend this money. Uh, and, and, and so basically in, where there was a policy push for the green economy, the wage premium for green job ad was high. But then, of course, in 2017-2019, we had Trump, so the US had Trump, and so basically, obviously, Trump, uh, you know, uh, canceled a lot of uh, policies that were uh, the follow-up of the green stimulus package of Obama, and so basically, this, of course, decreased also the wage premium for uh, this type of occupation, and this, of course, is an element of concern, because this, what, what does it mean? This, I mean, this, of course, is a, is a uh, kind of a, a bit speculative, because we, I mean, we, we, we are planning to to go more in detail on this in the future research uh, is a bit speculative, but what tells this? this? It tells us that if the green, if the green policies are ambitious, uh, companies are willing to pay a wage premium to attract the talents in green jobs, okay, in green position. This, what does it mean? That, of course, if you attract the talents, you are also more productive, you are also able to uh, develop the new technology, you are also able to speed up the adoption of existing technologies, uh, and uh, so you gain inefficiency, okay? However, if there are not ambitious climate policies, it's very, it's very quick that these, these, these employers are not willing to pay high wage, and so there are less incentive for the talents to be attracted by green positions. Okay? So, and I anticipate the issue of the Green Deal plans. Now, uh, the, 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 the last, because I think I'm running out of time, the last part of my talk will be on the effectiveness of the Green Deal plans of Obama in around 2000. And nine, two thousand and ten. So actually, uh, uh, we want to. I want to stress this uh, because this, of course, is an evaluation that is interesting per se. So how much, uh, how effective was the, uh, how, how effective is to spend money uh, after a recession in uh, green industrial policies rather than in other field. Uh, so that's interesting for uh, macroeconomics. That's why the paper is, is forthcoming on Brooklyn papers on economic activities, which is a macro journal. But here I want to stress an aspect of the paper that is very important for the rest of the talk, the previous part of the talk, that these effects of the green stimulus package, as, as I will show you, are crucially mediated by the viability of green skills in the local economy. Okay. So let me give you a bit of background here. 
So here we want to evaluate the American Recovery and Investment Act uh, stimulus package, and in particular, we want to evaluate the green part of this uh, uh, plan, which is around 70% of the total plan of the bank. Okay. And the plan, of course, has been approved after the uh, Great Recession of 2007-2008, and so the, the money has been start, started being, being spent in 2009, but then 2000 uh, being spent around the years between 2009 and 2012. Okay. Uh, so the, the, this was uh, uh, the program, uh, the money was spending cleanup of polluted sites, energy efficiency retrofits, development of renewable energy resources. So there are several uh, sub-programs within this program. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, we, we estimate the effect of this program at the level of the commuting zone, which is kind of like the metropolitan area, which is the, the, the definition of local labor market, looking at the mobility patterns of workers across uh, counties. Uh, and uh, so we, we estimate the effect at this level of aggregation, which is very similar to metropolitan area. And uh, we estimate the effect net of pre-trends. Why net of pre-trends? Because uh, we sh that our data shows, I don't have time to show, course, everything. But our data shows that areas that receive more green spending were also areas that were growing faster before the financial crisis. So actually, uh, the, the point is, the green spending went to areas that were already strong, in a way. Okay, they were already high tech, that were already uh, uh, areas that were, had, were on a path of, uh, of uh, strong economic growth. Okay. So actually, this is making it more difficult to estimate the impact, okay, and uh, to use uh, 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 to use standard uh, uh, econometric techniques. And, uh, 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 and it's very difficult. The, the, the key point of the empirical assessment is that it's very difficult to eliminate this pre-trend for, uh, for total employment, but the, we, don't, we don't observe pre-trend for employment in different sectors and occupations. So our results are much cleaner when we look at the effect of different sectors and occupations. Okay? So actually, which are the main results? The first main result is that the green spending uh, reshapes the economy. So green spending creates jobs that are manual, manual jobs, uh, green jobs, and construction jobs. So actually, that's a quite a positive uh, accounting of the green spending package because it's going to benefit the people that were hit uh, by other shocks that were against unskilled workers. So remember, you know, the, the trade shocks, uh, the, you know, the, the famous China shock that uh, destroyed a lot of employment in the US uh, and uh, the, uh, the um, automation. Okay, so the, the, it seems that this spending benefit this type of workers. Okay, this, so these are the, the effect year by year's effect. You see that manual, manual occupation, there has been a job creation for manual occupation after, I mean, the, 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 the year 2008 is, uh, is the benchmark here. Yeah? Is, uh, we set the effect to be zero in 2008, and you see that the effect for manual workers is positive and increase over time, and there is no pretend. Okay? And uh, also for construction workers, for green, green, green workers, the effect is largely imprecise estimated because there is measurement error, but I mean, it's significant anyway at conventional level when we look at, uh, when we look at you know, uh, effect aggregated by uh, broad superior. Okay. Um, so actually, the second point is that the effect of the green stimulus works more slowly than uh, the effect of other stimulus investments, which generally lead to short-term job creation. Okay, and and you see that the effect uh, is small in the short term but became bigger in the long term. However, as you can see here, uh, the effect on total employment is difficult to to uh, understand because there were pretrends before. Okay, so uh, we we can interpret this effect like saying, well. Uh, the green spending allowed the area that were growing faster before to go back to the previous growth path. So the, the accounting is positive because anyway, there has been a huge shock. Uh, would this area be able to go back to the previous growth path or not? I mean, for sure the green spending was, was helping on this, but we don't know how many of these jobs were just because the, the area were recovering themselves, they were more resilient or because of the green spending. Okay, so that's, I mean, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty here. However, this is the third result, the one that I want to emphasize more here. Uh, when we look at how these effects are mediated by the availability of green skills in the local labor market, when we look at this, we see that uh, the area with more green skills here is the percentiles of the green skills distribution. The area with the effect is uh, zero in area with small, with, with no green skills or with little share of green skills, but it became very quickly positive and statistically significant. Uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, sorry yeah, in uh, both the short term and the long term okay however you see that of, of course even here we have pretense so this is capture pretense but you see that uh, in spite of the pretend we have here an effect that uh, is uh, a net effect that is positive okay and the net effect for era that are at the top of the green skill distribution so they have more people with the right skills for green jobs is 40 percent higher than the average effect okay so there is a very huge gain in investing in green skills uh, as a complementary measure for uh, the uh, green recovery package just to let you know this one important point is that in the obama recovery package the, in the green part of the obama recovery package only one percent was spent in uh, green in training of uh, uh, workers okay and these uh, these evidence suggest that this was very little we should increase this and uh, this evidence is also reinforced by uh, other evidence in labor economics showing that investments in training uh, in the local labor market are the one that pay off the most uh, in terms of uh, uh, improving the local labor market condition so actually uh, uh, going back to the, the motivation of this talk, you remember the green plants spend too little for uh, skill retraining. Well, this, this evidence shows you that, yes, really too little. I mean, really, uh, this, there is room to improve a lot the allocation of spending uh, toward uh, retraining of workers and uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, the right skills. And wh what's the logic here? Why we need workers with the right skills? Of course, if you have a worker that already have the skills that are uh, adaptable to a green job is much, this worker became uh, at once higher, can be hired at once. You don't need the time to train this worker and to, you know, uh, that of course, and the resources also, the financial resources to, to, to be spent for training this worker. Okay. And so that's uh, a key point of, uh, of, of this. And uh, bear also in mind that, especially in, the, in a labor market like the US one, where there is uh, a lot of competition, there, is, uh, uh, there are not high firing costs, uh, the, the, the companies do much less on the job training. And so you really need the government to uh, jump in and invest in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in on the job training. Okay? In countries like Germany, the private sector is much more, much better equipped to uh, provide uh, themselves on the job training. And so probably uh, the, the need to green uh, reskilling investments by the public, by the government is less, okay? Uh, uh, because the issue is more, uh, the, the, the educational system is more uh, uh, adapted. <laughs> Just to stress one aspect here, uh, because this, this money went to area that were already in a, uh, strong path. I mean, this green spending money went to areas where already with with the right green skills, in a way. So it's a kind of it was a kind of picking the winner policy. This may exacerbate uh, regional inequality because area with the right green skills were also areas that were wealthier. Although, if I re redo this by uh, in, by uh, understanding the mediatic effect of green spending depending on the income of the region, I don't obtain this uh, increasing path. Okay, I'll obtain a flat line. Okay, so the, 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 the key measuring factor is green skills, it's not wealth. Okay, but area that have more green skills tend also to be wealthier. So, what's the problem here? Green spending tend to go to this area naturally, in a way, because they're also areas that develop these technologies. And so, basically, this tend, may, may exacerbate regional inequality. So, just to show you this, uh, the same will happen in Europe. <laughs> now, there is a lot of debate on will, will, how, how will uh, the green recovery package in Europe will impact uh, <clears throat> regions uh, and workers. Okay, how which, which will be the distribution effect? And uh, we develop a database using green production data, and we show that the, the, the region in Europe that have a green comparative advantage are the regions that are already rich: Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Austria. Okay, and so actually, uh, and and and, the, and the, the region that have a comparative advantage in polluting industry are countries that are already poor. So, and these are uh, a picture of this, of, of this paper. As a so owner, actually, about five minutes, uh, if yeah, I might yeah. say so, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, so the, the, okay. the, this Green Deal plan will, may have large distribution effect across countries, okay? Just, just to conclude, uh, and how to mitigate them, of course, we have to understand how to design just transition fund. Unfortunately, now in Europe, uh, the design of the just transition fund does not emphasize enough the need of retraining, which is, again, the main message of this of this talk. Uh, 
This, this approach can be used to understand the uh, distributional effect of reallocation cost. Uh, just, I mean, to let you notice that, uh, I mean, the effect of green era was mostly on manual occupation, much less on the other type of occupation. So employment gains are on an unskilled occupation. And this is important because if we uh, try to evaluate instead the effect of, of our carbon tax using energy prices like, I mean, in several papers uh, on uh, on uh, on different type of occupation, we see that manual workers are the losers in this case. Okay, we have a job loss for manual workers, so can and a job gain for technicians. So, uh, in a way, uh, if we implement a carbon tax, but we offset the carbon tax with a higher marking policy that is uh, uh, devote the revenue of the carbon tax for green spending, we will destroy jobs that are manual job in manufacturing in uh, uh, high carbon sector. But these workers can be reemployed in in, in green construction. Construction, for instance. Okay, so that, that's the idea of this of this. Okay, uh, and how easy is this allocation? Depend on the skill proximity of distance between jobs. This is shown by the quite of, uh, uh, of important literature in labor economics, and and so basically we try to understand how easy is to reallocate a worker displaced by. Uh, the, the 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 automation, the COVID crisis, and and the uh, and the um, and the carbon tax into these uh, green jobs. Let me skip this, and you see that, um, that just to preview these results that I, mean, I cannot describe in detail. But uh, the bottom line here is the following: Imagine that we want to take a low-skilled worker employed in brown manual jobs, and we want to employ this worker in into a, a growing manual job that is also green. Okay. How different are these two jobs in, in terms of skills? Well, in terms of skills, they're quite similar, in terms of green skills. Uh, they are quite similar in terms of educational requirement. Uh, and uh, however, they are quite different in terms of training requirement. I mean, the, the green job requires three months of training. So overall, it's not so difficult to take this brown manual occupation that has been, for instance, displaced by energy price, like I showed you in the previous slide, uh, and to take this and to employ this, this guy into a green job. However, however, you have to bear in mind that the, the wage, the pay scale can be a bit different. Normally, the pay scale for these low-skilled uh, jobs, in, uh, for, especially in the fossil fuel extraction industries, are higher, a bit higher than the, the skills for, the, 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 for these uh, very manual green jobs in construction. If you want to do the same, for a, a low skill occupation uh, that are displaced by automation or displaced by the COVID. I mean, the ONET database has been used to uh, build measure of automation risk, has been used to build measure of uh, how COVID will kick on certain occupation that of course are the one that require uh, social interactions. So actually imagine that now we want to use this green stimulus package to reemploy these people as well, not only the, the people displaced in brown sector, uh, this would be much more difficult. I mean, the, the training requirement in green job is much higher than the training requirement in this low-skilled occupation, exposed to automation or exposed to COVID. I mean, that will lose the job because of, of COVID, like, in, of course, in the tourist sector, in the uh, restaurants and so on. And also in terms of distance, uh, in terms of green skills, you know, that is, is very, very different. Okay, so this, this figure confirmed that on the job training is very important, again, and confirmed that it's easy to use the uh, green stimulus to employ brown workers, but it's much more difficult to use it to employ workers uh, that are displaced by other shocks. And so again, uh, in this case, we will need much more investment in, uh, in training requirements, so depending on which are the ultimate goals of uh, a green stimulus package. Okay. So I think that uh, if you want to wrap up with the insights, uh, uh, well, inside, first inside the task-based approach to use measurement error in assessing the size of the green labor market is a better indicator to understand the response to environmental policy of regional, uh, 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 on regional mm -hmm. labor market. So the methodology that we propose can be extended to other databases to identify green skills and training requirements. Uh, existing evidence emphasizes the importance of technical and vocational education, and uh, Germany can be considered like the, uh, the best practice example in, sen in the sense that they have a German is an institutional setting and training system that is very well designed for this. Okay? So it can be a source of inspiration to reform uh, these, uh, 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 these institutions that provide technical and vocational education. Third insights, in spite of skill bias effect, labor market inequality induced by environmental policies may not be so large as the winner and loser partial overlap, they have a kind of similar skill set. However, there is much less overlapping if we want to use the green stimulus push 
to target, to reemploy worker displaced by the COVID or by automation. Okay? <clears throat> so in this case, the, the investments in training that I just show you that are very important, they should be also scaled up. Okay? And uh, uh, obviously, training investments should be a key part of the EU Green Deal or every Green Deal to reduce uh, the allocation cost. Fourth, fourth inside that the green policies may exacerbate regional inequalities. Okay, so the winners are regions with a strong technical and engineering know-how that are already in a growing path, or they are already, you know, anyway, uh, wealthier. Okay, and uh, so the designing of the just transition funds to, to enhance the skill in larger regions is very important. Okay, uh, and also it's very important to bear in mind that I mean it's not only important to invest in uh, uh, green skills. It's not only important to invest in the uh, in the supply part of the of the economy, but it's also important to identify in which niche a given country can specialize and can become a leader, uh, can be build a comparative advantage in, in in green sector and production. So, for instance, in Italy, we can think about becoming you know a leader in green architecture or in bicycle. Okay, we are a big producer of bicycle. France can become a leader in green organic food. So we, each country has to combine these retraining policies with policies that are green industrial policies in the sense of trying to understand which sector the country can build a comparative advantage. Perhaps India can build a comparative advantage in wind turbines or, uh, or uh, uh, in uh, uh, ICT application related to the green economy. Of course, that there, are, there are several. I think I, I finish uh, with, with this and uh, I mean, I'm happy thank you very you. much, uh, Professor Bona. There are some questions that have come in. Uh, so uh, they've been sent to me. So let me read them out to you. Uh, yes. Uh, so the first question is from. Uh, M.G. Chandrakant, and the, let me read out the question to you. <clears throat> the question is, how green is our work, especially online presentations in conferences? Yes, on the one hand, travel costs are cut due to improved communication, which is green. However, the extent of use of hardware is getting replaced fast due to obsolescence forcing purchase of new desktops, laptops, mobiles, virtually every three to five <coughs> years, even on a conservative basis. With not so convincing green disposal plans, which should worry us, probably referring to disposal of e-waste. What policies would you suggest address this predicament? Okay, I mean, uh, that's, I mean, a, a very, a very interesting and sensitive comment because actually I didn't have time to talk about this, but there are two main definitions of what is green. Okay, one definition is that about the potential of a technology or a production to reduce harmful environmental. Impact. So an example is a wind turbine. Wind turbine has a potential to reduce CO2 emission, but if you then produce all the parts of the wind turbine using coal, I mean, uh, burning coals, of course, the net effect is a bit ambiguous, and of course we know, all, all of us, we know that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, lots of green technologies require these rare, rare materials that uh, then are extracted in uh, developing countries, uh, I mean, exploiting labor, I mean, in very, very bad condition, okay, and, and polluting rivers, and so actually what we are doing is really green, I don't know, but, I mean, the, focus, the point is that this technology has a potential to reduce harmful impact. Then there is another notion of what is green that I didn't cover here, but as you know, this question is, is very relevant for this. That is, how, how, which is the carbon content of products, okay? Of or products or activities in general, okay? That's the other definition. And for this, you, you need a, a lot of data. I mean, you, you, we, I'm, I'm trying to I have a friend here that is, do, is doing, is trying to understand the carbon content of buildings. He's an engineer, he's a company, and he's, he's very good in doing this. Uh, and I, I, I try to, to start working with them, but the way they compute the carbon content of building is, I mean, uh, the, the accuracy is very low. Okay, so they, they make a lots of assumptions. I mean, even us as economists, <laughs> we will be a bit scared of this. So it's just to tell you that, I mean, computing the carbon content of product is very complicated. Um, now we have a project of trying to do this at the firm level because we know the, uh, the emission at the firm level. So if we can link this emission 
with a kind of a skill and, and occupation that the firm use, you can try to understand which, which is the uh, kind of carbon content of an occupation, okay? Uh, but again, you can observe only the emission of the firm. You cannot observe all, in the, all the indirect emission. Of course, you can observe the indirect emission. You, can, you have to make assumption. We have a paper on this on, uh, uh, on the impact of imported carbon emission on emission for French companies. But to do this is, is not very accurate because you, you have only imported carbon emission on the sector level. So you have to assume that the company imported carbon emission are the same of the one of the sector. So you can do this, but it's a strong assumption. Okay. So overall, I mean, the, I, I think we need a lot of research and I think that's very important to build database that have reliable carbon content. I just wanted to mention also uh, that the questioner had a point about disposal. So even, even if the uh, um, kind of output is green or methods are green, there's still the question of e-waste. So let me move on. The next um, questioner uh, wants to know how do you place or where do you place in terms of rank or ranking, I suppose, traditional knowledge, yeah? Well, traditional knowledge, traditional knowledge okay. as a green skill. And uh, just so that we have an idea what he has in mind, he has added an example could be the cha snake charmer's skill. Anyway, you don't have to, you don't have to focus on the last point. Uh, I suppose the generic question is about traditional knowledge as a green skill. Do you think there is something there? I, I think that is, that's super important. Time ago with a friend, I, I started discussing, I mean, I have a friend that uh, is very much into the organic uh, food uh, here in, uh, in the, in the province region. And uh, he has lots of, knows a lots of people that are the firm, the first uh, organic food producer in the Northern Italy, okay, in the Piemonte region. Uh, and, we, and we wanted to understand, I mean, we start talking, I mean, that remains something just to talk, uh, how, how, how we, I mean, how much, to what extent we are, we, we are using the knowledge of our grand grandparents in organic food production and to what extent we need instead to complement this knowledge with knowledge from universities or with new knowledge, okay? To what extent we need a mix? And they were saying, look, uh, of course we are using the knowledge of grand grandparents, but uh, we also need the university uh, to get to start working on this uh, because we have a lot of, of uh, margin of improvements. And so uh, to respond to this, I think we need a mix of the two. So we need for sure to go back to some uh, common sense uh, uh, form of knowledge. For instance, uh, you mentioned the, 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 the disposal. I mean, we know that, I mean, all the agriculture was very good in using all the all the parts, you know, to reuse everything, you know, uh, so there was this circular. Uh, but also we need new knowledge to improve the efficiency of this. I, mean, I think this is an area that is extremely important uh, and uh, to, to combine, uh, to combine the two. Right, I, I guess since uh, um, uh, we, we, we are in India, at least in a virtual sense uh, now, uh, there would be the um, uh, offering, so to speak, of traditional medicine is certainly something which uh, would count as uh, a, a green uh, a green input. All right, let me move on to the next uh, speaker. So um, one, uh, one speaker is very impressed by, your, by the software you use, Professor Vona and he, uh, Anupam Tyagi, and he has the question, what software uh, do you use to make your graphs? They are very good. <laughs> it's data. Actually, actually it's data. about the graphs, you have to. Uh, I have to especially thanks. Sometimes I mean, sometimes myself, sometimes my co-author, especially my co-authors, we use a lot of uh, you know different stuff. You know, right? From okay. Our, uh, okay. You don't have to give away your trade secrets. That was just <coughs> for your amusement. Our uh, success <laughs> data. Excuse me. So uh, this is the last of the questions that come in so far from Guy Tri Kunte. And uh, the question goes, uh, thank you, Francesco, for sharing your insights today. Just another side to the argument, could the introduction of price ceilings, an upper limit over which the price of green products cannot rise uh, to increase aggregate demand, I see, for green products, 
also help increase the proportion of green jobs, i.e. basically uh, could, we, uh, uh, could we have price ceilings for green products so that the demand for green products increases and therefore the proportion of green jobs rises. But as you, sorry, I should let you, let you answer that. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, please. Well, well, well I, I think here we are raising an issue that, uh, I mean, well, uh, of course, I mean, the, the point is that if the demand of green product will increase, uh, we expect that, I mean, the, the demand of, of green jobs will increase. I mean, it can be not one one, one uh, proportion. I mean, uh, we are trying now to understand exactly this with this European database, to what extent, you know, the, 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 the labor intensity of uh, green production, okay? Um, but here, there is another uh, point behind that is, uh, I mean, it's not obvious how to increase uh, the demand of green products, okay? So actually, if green products are luxury products, uh, actually to increase the demand of green products, even with a subsidy, can benefit the ultra rich. And that there is uh, some evidence in the US that all the subsidies to, uh, to, to green products uh, from electric vehicles to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, eco build, uh, building retrofits, they disproportionately benefits the rich. So actually, I think here, rather than giving a subsidy to green product or putting a, a seeding to the price of green product, but of course you have them to compensate the company somehow because otherwise the company go out of the market. Uh, I think it's most important, uh, in my perspective, uh, to reduce inequality, to create a mass demand for green products uh, in the economy. That's, I mean, far more important than giving a subsidy. Except, Francesco, the question is, uh, how without taxes or subsidies can you raise the demand for a particular product as opposed to the traditional macroeconomic stimulus which just raises aggregate demand but you talk about green stimulus you want a stimulus right which is green in terms of its impact and which would should therefore target green products also in the deeper sense that you pointed out that uh, you could have green products like wind energy, but if you're going to produce it by using a hell of a lot of coal, that's not going to be much useful. So I'm just <laughs> saying, when you want uh, a green stimulus, some issue of targeting arises. And this question is probably generally pointing in that direction. Let me move on. Uh, unless you want to, is there something you want to say by way of response? Of course, I mean, if you want, I will send you, I mean, uh, uh, there is just a new working paper of the OECD that I drafted for the OECD uh, that uh -huh. is tackling exactly this issue of the design of the stimulus and exactly one of the points I want I mean, to make again is that right. green stimulus trying to push the demand for green product with a subsidy, which is the standard way every country does, is All going right. to be very regressive uh, against the middle class and the poor unless the subsidy is not targeting the, the, the pe directly the people with the low and middle income. However, even if you target the people with low and middle income, we have example in the US and in other countries that there is a rebound effect. So the environmental effect is smaller. Why there is a rebound effect? Because most of these subsidies are not combined with a, with a stick, so with a carbon tax. So actually it's very complicated. The design of, of this environmental policy is very complicated to, to, neutralize, to neutralize the distribution effect and at the same time stimulate demand and at the same time to keep the environmental impact good because you know, to neutralize Absolutely. the rebound effect is very complicated. Let, let, let's move on so that- uh, I, I, I must, uh, I've already posted that paper in the chat box, Francesco. I, I, I really Francesco. like that paper. It's the triple triple dividend paper, right? The one that you just wrote in yeah, this yeah, yeah, December. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're, yeah you're, exactly. it's great, and you have said there is a health dividend, but otherwise it's regressive. So <laughs> no, it's a, it's a wonderful paper. I just posted it in the chat box. Thanks, hello, just just you. confirm if that's the same one. Yeah. Great. Now, so, so let's move on very quickly. There are three questions. I think um, Francesco. I'm sure all all your listeners. Uh, uh, would like a, a reply, so if possible, so let's do them quickly. Uh, from Anjali Sharma, employment activities based on recycle, repair, and reuse are depleting as these activities do not virtually contribute towards the GDP and are valued minimally. Please shed your insights on this. 
Uh, well, actually, I'm not. I mean, uh, honestly, I mean that's a key. Po I, I, that's a key point. I mean, uh, I, I think that uh, I mean in general, uh, if we have a view of long term, the view of uh, these activities to be central to our society is really important. And again, I think that uh, education more than skills is very important to train our kids how to uh, reuse uh, products, how to you know not not want every month a new mobile phone or whatever. Okay, so that's, it's part of the skill in terms of behavior. So we need to have people that want to have the behavior for a society that is a bit more uh, uh, a, a kind of uh, parsimonious, Green like I mean, so just Reagan was telling this, you know, we need to, to be a bit more, and I think that's, we, we have to train this, because it's something that you don't get like this. If you are used to have everything, especially in, in Western countries, you are not trained to say, okay, I will give up to have another mobile phone, instead I will repair my mobile phone. So that's, uh, right. in, term of, in, in terms of how these activities uh, translate in terms of employment, uh, this is difficult to measure. I mean, uh, is uh, is extremely difficult to measure. Uh, I think there is uh, some some research trying to do this. I mean, uh, uh, there are still not not really good data, but I think that uh, uh, is uh, is extremely important. And I, and I think we'll translate in terms of GDP because anyway, you pay wages to these people, so this right. will be uh, uh, actually, actually, the GDP. Even though the, actually, even though the uh, question started out uh, mentioning employment, the question was about contribution to GDP. Don't bother. You're not expected to respond. Let me move uh, on. So I guess well, here the point. The point is that uh, even if it doesn't contribute to GDP, you might have a greener economy. So for that reason, uh, you know, you would uh, you would actually want. To. Let me move on because there are questions pouring in for you, Francesco. You have many admirers here, it seems. Uh, right. So, all right. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, now, well, uh, that's it. It seems. I think I have run out of all of them. Uh, right, yeah, and yeah, she can't just said uh, confirm that once again by message to me that uh, the last paper that you mentioned about the triple dividend uh, has been sent out by him to all the entire audience. Since there's a little more time, I will finish early so that the organizers have enough time. Uh, if nobody else has a question, I have a question for uh, Professor Vona. Uh, just a comment, really, Francesco, for your very interesting paper. You know, just to be a bit uh, difficult, uh, I want to say that uh, I'm, I'm a little unconvinced as yet, but I need to think about green jobs and green uh, green tasks. Surely it is an output is green or a technology is green, and the example of a technology being green is exactly what you have given, uh, that of you know, uh, uh, generating wind energy using a hell of a lot of coal, which is a darn stupid thing to do, right? Uh, but that would be an example of you know, uh, a green output, if you wish, but a, 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 a non-green technology. So uh, once again, I find it a little, a little difficult to, imagine green tasks and green jobs. And here again, the uh, Asimoglu outer uh, study, which is looking at the impact of uh, information technology on employment, I'm not entirely convinced that it's the right framework to look at that, because there, there is a hell of a lot of substitutability possible, presumably, because between robots humans and certain kind of activities, I am not sure that that kind of substitutability between, as you use the word, factors of production uh, exists when it comes to, uh, yeah, when it comes to uh, assessing greenness. So that's just a general comment. And I want to say what, I, what I'm suggesting uh, seems to be borne out by your own results. Because after all this, you can correct me if I haven't understood your result properly, which is probably the case, or rather could be the case. At the end of the day, it's still the engineers who are the greenest, <laughs> right? It, yeah. So uh, if that is so, if that is so, then your argument, and you, you make it again and again and again, and I'm not sure, I'm trying to say that engineers don't know that, don't require training, then your argument, it is 
training rather than education that matters for greenness or for a green stimuli or a green economy in general, th that weakens because which in, if the engineers are the greenest. No, 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 they're, they're not the greenest. Huh? They're technicians on the greenness. They're mid right. skills, they're not engineers. These, right, these mid skills are engineering skills, but they're not right, engineers. Right, 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 right. No, but that's yeah. semantics, right? It's clearly. Uh, no, 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 it's different. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, so anyway, so that is a little comment that I, I, a little something that I thought about, but um, if there are no more questions, no, no, but uh, uh, these, these are yeah, very please, interesting is, comments. Is it, yeah, is there anything you'd like to say in general? Uh, no, 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 I, I want to respond to, your, to Yeah, please. I want please. to respond to your comments because please, they're very please. interesting. I mean, on, on the last comment, I mean, the first two comments are, are, are super interesting. I will re reply, I will reply later. On the last please. comment, perhaps I was not clear. It's not engineers that matters. It's engineering and technical skills that, uh, no, no, I, I will show you, no, sorry, I will show you all the slides. You want, I show you again. No, 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 I'm sure you're right. But I'm just no, saying, no, no. Say I mean, yeah. I show you again because now I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, let, look here. Yeah, technical technicians win here. Uh, no, because I mean, uh, here is technical skills that win. I mean, uh, here technical skills, technical skills that are not only engineers, right. technical skills, not only among engineers, but technical skills among installation and maintenance and repairing occupation, technical I skills see. among drafter technician. I mean, then again. If you go to see the green skills, they are not correlated with education. These are engineering and technical skills. They are not correlated with education. They are not correlated with the routine task intensity. And these skills encompass engineering skill, but they, they are also building and construction, mechanically drafting. So these are the skills that you acquire through on the job training or vocational program in education. I, I'm not saying that engineering is not important, but is important engineering, but are important also middle technical skills. And uh, the evidence shows that if you have to compare the two, perhaps middle technical skills are even more important. Okay, and so we need on the job training rather than education. That's I mean just to to give the the, the policy message, you know that because that should be very clear. On the uh, on the previous uh, points, you said you raised you raise very very important part. I mean, the first point you say that I'm skeptical about the use of task to measure green jobs. Well, actually, I perfectly understand it's very difficult to uh, enter in this task-based literature. I, th I think it, it takes a lot of time, uh, but just to let you understand a bit better, I mean, a task is actually a description of what the, the worker is doing on the job. So it's very linked to the technology. So actually the task and the technology are very similar. When, when you have a patent, you describe the patent, you know, the claim of the patent, you can say, well, this claim is green, uh, this claim is not green, okay? And in this way, David Pop, you know, build all this measure of green patterns. Okay, that became very popular. Then the task is a bit the same, you know, because you have this description. And so you can, uh, it's like the interface between labor and technology. Okay, here you have the technology, here you have workers, and the task is like the interface between the two. So you can extract information from the text of the task or the text of the job ad to understand which technology they are using. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so you can build the measure of exposure of green technology, of brown technology, and so on. And that's what has been done by Otto Reasemoglu. So this is the part of Otto Reasemoglu that we take here, okay? That's the part. Then when you, when you say, well, but I'm not convinced about the substitutability, I completely agree with you at the macro level. So at the macro level, I, I also think, I mean, I, uh, I think that the natural capital is very difficult to substitute with other activity. I, complete, I completely share this view, and I 100% with you. However, when we, it comes to understand uh, the activities that are required to produce green technology in a way, okay, so in manufacturing, but there, these activities are normal activities. You can use capital, labor, and so in this framework, this task approach can work, you know, in, in, in a way. So that's the, that's the idea. So I just wanted to uh, amplify what Francisco, you were saying. So for example, in India, uh, we have a, a ministry for uh, skill development and entrepreneurship, and I just posted a couple of hyperlinks and this goes directly to this conversation with uh, Bala. So for example, we are developing, you know, and you were saying that in EU, you want to promote more training. So this is already a program because India, as you know, is going heavy into renewables and you mentioned wind turbines, but even low things like solar photovoltaic cell installer, or you have, for example, a wastewater treatment plant helper. 
or a wastewater treatment plant technician. So these are the kinds, if I've understood you correctly, these are the kinds of those middle level skills where the job is already described in the job description. So here at the IIIT Delhi, there is a sewage treatment plant that I go past and there is a guy sitting there. So I guess these are the ones that you were actually mentioning in terms of very clearly identifiable uh, skills, you know, so, so anyway, you know, in India, I, I'll, I'll be a little facetious. All our engineers are actually joining uh, uh, consumer goods companies and selling soap and Coca-Cola, you know, they're not working as engineers anymore. <laughs> If I may actually also ask, uh, with the permission of the chair, so what happens to the fact that when you were scoring the manual labor who were doing, let's say, uh, repetitive jobs, so if one looks at the lowest ladder where you have scavengers uh, separating the waste, so they get marked pretty low because their task is valued pretty low and that also goes back to something that was being asked earlier in terms of the contribution to gdp so you have these shadows of you know people who are actually doing a great job especially in a country like india which is where these workers are all part of the informal sector versus being in the formal sector of the waste treatment and management in eu so how would you comment on what happens to the scoring that you were giving in your enumeration calibration? You, can you unmute yourself? Thanks. Thanks for the th thanks for the the question, uh, uh, which is very 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 interesting. Actually, let me go back to the slide on this actually here i mean i think that you were referring to these slides where we, we score different type of group of occupation you know it's like brown occupation low skill with the high automation probability low skill occupation at risk because of covid actually i mean between this occupation with low skill with the high automation probability or low skill with risk because of covid um how to say, uh, they, they are not, I mean, they are low skilled, but I mean, they are kind of occupation that can be in, uh, uh, in the industrial sector, okay? So they can be uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in, um, or because of COVID can be in the restoration, in the hotel. Um, so actually are generally occupations that, uh, I mean, require uh, quite little education, quite little uh, on the job training. And, uh, and so for this occupation, moving the message to green, uh, low-skilled occupation uh, is a bit difficult because these low, green low skill occupation are more kind of uh, uh, requiring uh, this kind of uh, uh, technology-related skills, okay? And uh, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the informal sector, unfortunately here, we, we, we have no clue on how, you know, to, uh, to but it's, of, of course, it's an extremely important uh, issues that, I mean, uh, I think should be uh, adapted also to the type of activity. I mean, I, uh, more in general, I think that uh, the fact that, I mean, these green uh, technologies require kind of specific skills, I think is it's extremely important to try to do this type of analysis by type of problem. Okay, so we have an environmental problem related to waste management. So we have to understand in this particular problem, which type of competencies and which type of uh, uh, valuable uh, persons can be employed in this. We have a problem on it. And so that's, I, I think that, I mean, uh, when somebody asks me, ah, oh, which are for you the avenue for future research? One of the main avenues is to understand what happened in kind of labor market that are related to a specific environmental problem. And that's, I think, uh, something that uh, uh, is, uh, is extremely important. And, uh, uh, but I, I, honestly, I mean, our research, on, on uh, the issue that you raise, I have very little to say. I mean, I think <laughs> it's, it would be better to start a new, <laughs> a new research, uh, a new research project on uh, on trying to capture what what you are saying because it's uh, yeah. okay, it's, Professor Voda. I think uh, the organizers have given me only an hour and a half, and we are, we are exactly there. It's five p.m. Uh, I, before I conclude, I just want to say that uh, somebody has very nicely clarified uh, for me, obviously, what you had in mind and give me two examples of jobs which need engineering skills, but does not require engineers. The first is solar PV, I suppose, photovoltaic installation. 
in, uh, you don't need engineers, but you need engineering skills is what this person is suggesting. And the other example is water treatment plants. So you have somebody in the audience clarifying uh, what you that had in mind. Me. So thank you so. very much. Yeah. It's exactly 5 p.m. for coming and talking to us about the skills necessary for a green economy. And I can assure you that we need to worry about this very seriously in India because we have a serious environmental, uh, we have serious environmental challenges and to deal with it uh, needs not only money, but as you very carefully put it in your slides, an immaterial infrastructure, uh, which obviously is skills that we need to think about it. So thank you very much on behalf of the organizers, thank you, Professor Vona, all participants and everybody who sent in questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a great pleasure to be, an, an honor more than a great pleasure to be invited. Well, because, thank uh, you very honor. much indeed. I hope that we will anyway be, be in touch. Don't hesitate if uh, somebody is interested in these topics among your groups. I mean, Absolutely. I'm always happy Absolutely. to talk uh, and also after the conference. You know. I, I'm so, sure uh, Shri Kant and Aparna have heard you and they will yes. convey your message to INSE. Thank you very much indeed. No, thank you, thank you so Pana, much. Stay yeah. around. We'll be moving right into our valedictory. And Francesco, I know you're going to a farewell because you're saying farewell to Sion Spo and probably going back to Italy. Yeah, I'm uh, going back to Italy in the University of Milan. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. so here is a Piedmo and you'll get some good Barolo over there. I'm a great fan of Italian <laughs> wine. So, so, molto grazie, molto grazie <laughs> for, your, uh, for your wonderful talk. You're, a, you're an incredible researcher and we have gained a lot. This whole green scale business is really uh, very, very interesting. So, thank you so much. And uh, you have to rush for your farewell lunch, as I was told by Aparna. So um, we are just in time. And uh, Bala, thank you so much. Um, thank you. She now you're a part Aparna. of INSEE. Excellent. So thank you so much, um, you. Francesco. Uh, Aparna, you want to say anything to Francesco? Um, yes, I just want to say it was just wonderful, very enlightening, because you took on a subject where, I mean, we have very nebulous ideas. We keep referring to green jobs and green skilling, where you can have really thrashed it out for us and scoring it, giving it a lot of structure. And yes, you're right. I mean, for a country like India, I mean, we need to kind of use this and come up with newer ideas. So this was so wonderful. Thank you. And you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot and to you. And I really hope to be in touch uh, in, the, in the future. In the absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.